Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we are going to talk about the only models that actually matter, of course. <laughs> so forget everything you've learned the last few days. Um, first is the models. But before I start, I wanted to give you a little bit of history. So the first climate models we actually had were just atmosphere only models. And that's because the first interest humans had in modeling was um, weather forecast. They were interested in what the weather will be tomorrow. And military was really interested in weather forecasts. So the first numerical models started in the 60s as weather forecast models. Um, and by the 70s, um, we had some more or less functioning um, climate models, but they were atmospheric only models. And then people realized that the ocean is actually important too, because the ocean has a big heat capacity. So if you just force your atmospheric only models with um, sea surface temperature of only conditions from the ocean, if you don't vary those, you might actually miss out on long term variability, of course. And so that's in the 70s. In the 80s, they started to have ocean circulation models and to couple them. And of course, as soon as you start to couple an atmospheric model and an ocean model, you also have to think about sea ice, otherwise something weird happens at the pole, your water is super cool. So you need, you need some representation of sea ice. So the first models that were coupled, ocean atmospheric models, actually used flux adjustments. That's what they called at that time. That was basically a boundary layer between these two that was like a sponge where each model calculated the fluxes that it wanted to give to the other model, and then these fluxes were a little bit muddled through that the other model saw what it actually wanted to see. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a cheating factor. And that's not the case anymore. Most of the coupled atmosphere ocean models now are without the flux adjustments and the fluxes right goes through. Okay, so now we're in the 80s here. Um, in the 90s, people started to think, oh wait, there's land too. <laughs> Maybe it's interesting to see what happens over land because, of course, there is some interesting interactions between vegetation and the climate in terms of roughness, in terms of albedo, in terms of evapotranspiration. It's really important to actually get your vegetation right. And about the same time, people also realized, oh, there's a whole biogeochemical cycle in the ocean. And so, of course, all these biogeochemical cycles in the climate, they're very closely connected. And, and if you're just interested in the physics of climate, which people were until the 80s, they miss a whole big part of the climate system. Okay. So it's really in the 90s that people started to get the first ocean ecology, biogeochemistry models into the ocean models, and some more complex plant ecology models into the land surface models. And they're still working on it today. And very recently, and that's lots of groups are working on it right now, um, people realized, oh wait, there's also continental ice sheets. And it's probably not a smart idea to just keep them constant, especially with future climate change, where we are actually really increasing the temperature quite rapidly. These um, continental ice sheets, unfortunately, have, have the unfortunate behavior to be nonlinear. So they can actually just break off and disintegrate quite quickly. And it would be good to be able to model this and predict this. And coupling continental ice sheets to all these other components is difficult because there's a big mismatch of scales. So for continental ice sheets, for example, what's important is to get really the circulation under ice shelves right, because that's where we can attack our ice sheets the best. We can attack them from above through atmospheric fluxes, but it's much more efficient to attack them from below, from the ocean, because that's already a very close freezing point, this water at the interface between the ice shelves and, 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 and the water. So if we just increase the water temperature by even half a degree or 0.3 degrees, we can attack the ice shelves. And if we attack the ice shelves from below, the ice shelves can disintegrate. If the ice shelves disintegrate, they actually fluctuate the big ice sheets behind and the whole ice sheet starts to flow. So people are still trying to get that right because to get that right, you need very high resolution under the ice shelves. You need high resolution also on the ice sheets to get the classification right. But on the same time, the ice sheets themselves are on long time scales, so it's a little bit hard. And then there's, of course, also marine sediments, something that most of the climate models completely ignore, but they're actually important because they can actually have an impact um, on timescales even of 10 to hundreds of years, because these <coughs> marine sediments, they can release nutrients um, into the ocean and change the productivity and therefore change the carbon cycle, therefore change CO2, therefore change the climate um, on, on very short timescales. And they can also release um, ions, like I will get to that in, in a so in my perfect world, the perfect model versus the model would be that. Having all these components in the same model, and of course I can tell you right away that doesn't exist. We're still working on it. But if you want to get the climate system right and understand variability and have all the feedbacks included, um, that's what you would theoretically need. 
So by definition, actually, Earth system models are models that include the physical, chemical, and biological processes of the Earth system because they're all interconnected, they all feedback from each other. Okay? So my understanding is that the first two days you spend in the physical space, maybe with Anna a little bit in the biological, is that right? Yeah, okay, so today we're doing lots of biogeochemistry and how it all connects to each other. Okay, so I wanted to, um, oh yeah, Hurst. Who knows her still? Yay. <laughs> so she actually used to be a CLEC student. Uh, she used to be my PhD student, Caitlin. Um, she graduated last year. She's now in England. And before she started her PhD, um, she wrote a really interesting um, paper with somebody else, not with me, unfortunately, uh, about software structure and uh, Earth system models. And she looked at Earth system models that were used for the last IPCC assessment season five. And what she did here, so here is an, an example that CSM1, she, she made these blobs for different modules, and the size of these blobs more or less reflects the complexity of each module. Okay? So you can see here that um, the, the land module in CSM1 is much smaller than the atmosphere model, for example, so it will be less complex. And then you see how they actually communicate with each other. In this case, every one of these modules is pretty much standalone, and then they calculate the fluxes and their interfaces, and they give it to a coupler, and then the coupler redistributes. So basically, the coupler is talking to everyone. Okay. So that's for CSM1, it's an American model. Um, GIS, also an American model, pretty much looks the same. The coupler is in the middle here. All these components are on the outside, and they all communicate with each other through the coupler. Um, so what we see is like a star-like software structure, okay? And all the American models seem to be built that way. Um, there's also a GFDL, it's also an American model, it's almost star-like, it's a little bit weird, it has this link here through sea ice. So this model basically assumes that there is a layer of sea ice between the ocean and atmosphere everywhere. And when there's no sea ice in the tropics, it just feeds <laughs> fluxes through the sea ice model, okay? But if you take that away, it's still a star-like architecture. And these star-like architectures have some um, positive points. So A, it's really easy to change or, or work on any of these components. If you're a PhD student and you're just supposed to work on the ocean component, you don't even have to look at the other ones. It's very easy. You just look at this code, do whatever you want to do, a couple of days, care of the rest. Um, you can mix and match. So I know for GIS, for example, quite often, in, within the GIST group, people use different ocean models. Really easy to just plug in another ocean module with this uh, software structure. But of course, the coupler, building the coupler is really challenging um, because it has to manage fluxes for four or five different modules. There are different time scales, there are different spatial scales, so that makes it complicated. And um, to parallelize a model like this is a nightmare. It can be a nightmare because, because you have all these different components and they all go through this same model. Okay, let's go to Europe. Um, Hatch M2, that's uh, a British model. Looks very different, you know? There's no star shape anymore, there's just an atmosphere and an ocean. And these monsters here just gobbled up the, the other components. So the lead sits within the atmosphere, the chemistry sits within the atmosphere, and CS and, and biogeochemical module sits within the ocean. Okay? Uh, same for the German model, and same for the French model. So, for Europe, anything? <laughs> we have a different structure. <laughs> uh, in that case, um, we basically retain the, the history of, of just have, having atmosphere ocean coupled models. So what they did, they took their, because all these models, let's face it, they're really old, right? I mean, some of the code lines in these models are like from the 60s or 70s, and people just add and add and add to them, that's why they're such monsters. Where whenever somebody comes actually and knows something about computing or IT, they look at our code and they just can't believe how we can work with these monsters because they have such a legacy. So these models just kept the legacy of atmosphere ocean models and just put things into the two big components. And that has, um, the, the positive point, it's much easier to parallelize those because you only have really two big components, so you only have to parallelize these two. Um, but of course, um, it's much harder if you just want to change a little bit of the sea ice in the ocean model. Here you actually have to go through the whole code of the ocean to understand where your sea ice is. So it's a little bit less 
user-friendly and the whole mix-and-match um, approach is pretty much impossible. Um, it, they seem like a paradise because you only have two big models. Anyway, so, and then you have a third class, and these are emics. These are, of course, the best models out there. <laughs> and those are a little bit less complex in terms of resolution, sometimes in terms of dynamics, but they have more processes in them than the normal couple of GCM. So here, for example, you have a UMIC model, that one has a sediment model, it also has an ice sheet model, not in, in, in the version she analyzed here. There's Lovklin, um, doesn't have a sediment model, but has a pretty big um, ocean component and a bigger atmosphere component than you think. So these are intermediate models. Okay, so if you look at them all together, there's one thing that really stands out that all the really coupled GCMs still have enormous atmosphere components. And I think that's just a history fact because we started with atmosphere models. People were always more interested by the atmosphere than by the ocean. And these modules are just stay the most complex. Um, also, some of them, I think, this. Some of them are actually have a dual use as weather forecasting models still. So, of course, they need the two remix have a larger code base for the ocean because they were actually built to climate change on, on long reference. So that's where the ocean is more important. Um, and then um, I think all I want you to get out of this here, especially as PhD students, um, is that all these models put emphasis on different modules of the climate system. So if you want to actually study a certain question in climate science, the right approach would be to first think which parts of the climate system are really the most important to my research question. And then you look at the zoo of models that you can use and you pick the one that has the best representation of this one module that you believe is the most important for your research question. So don't just take a model like AXIS because it's the Australian model. Really think about what, which model would be the most useful. And you can see here that um, some of them have, for example, bigger modules in atmospheric chemistry than others. Right. So if your if your project with most of atmospheric chemistry, you would probably try to get CSM one or Hadron two. Um, some have more land or more substantial land components or biogeochemistry components. So I think this is just something to keep in mind. Not every model is well suited for every project you want to apply it for. Okay. So um, Australia, of course, has its own model too. Um, that's the ESM, I think we will hear more about this today, so I won't tell much about it. Um, and I have to say this is pretty new, um, but my students is working, with it, but yeah, we will hear about it later. Okay, so um, for the rest of this, so, so I, I thought I could continue like this for a whole lecture, going to software of, and, and structure of different models, but I thought that by, by the end of, of this hour you will hope to so I thought maybe a better approach would be to just um, look at some climate events we know happened in the past, we more or less know what happened, and then think through which models you would actually use to try to simulate these events. So this is what we're going to do now, and I wanted to start with one that's my preferred, but I really like it because it's so far out and crazy. Um, the Palo CPU seed thermal maximum. And this is my colleague, oops, sorry, no, that's not my no, still not my colleague. <laughs> this is my colleague and friend Jim Zakos here. He's standing um, in the cold North Pacific off the coast of Santa Cruz, that's where he works, with a plastic replica, I think, and I don't think that's a real thing, of um, a sediment core that he got out of the South Atlantic. Um, he, when, when he got this core out, um, he was like one of the first ones to actually investigate this event. Um, one thing that was striking was this change in color. I think everybody can see it. It goes from white to brown. Okay. So sediment cores on the bottom of the ocean, all they do is they actually accumulate all the gunk that comes down, rains down in, in, in the water column over time. So what we can see is the accumulation of whatever rained down over time. So in this case, we had some white stuff that rained down and some, some brown stuff that rained down. And we try to understand why. So the white stuff here is nothing else than calcium. So there's organisms in the ocean, they build their shells out of calcium carbonate, and calcium carbonate is white. Right? And then something happened, and all these critters dissolved. It became too acidic, it became too corrosive, all the calcium carbonate was like, done, and it became brown. Okay? So we have a big acidification event here. And what else do we know? 
If we look back, so the Paleocene Eocene maximum happened here a long time ago. That's millions of years on the x-axis here. Before it happened, just before it happened, the climate was much warmer than today. So, and that's important to know because lots of people say this event is a great analog to present-day climate change. It actually is not because it happened already at a climate that was much warmer. Okay, so the feedbacks were different. But you can see it was quite warmer, and then you see this little blip here, and that's our Paleocene Eocene level maximum. So for some reason, temperature just became really, really hot, and then cooled down again. And the ocean became quite corrosive. Um, for those of you who are not so good at geology, um, I'm not either, um, basically happened after the dinosaurs and before humans. <laughs> um, actually, interestingly, after this event, horses evolved, so we like horses, it's an important event for you. And primates evolved too, so maybe we wouldn't be here actually with all that event. Um, we know that this event was caused by a massive release of carbon into the atmosphere, that's why people study it, because it's the closest we have in the geological record to what we do today, so if it already happened in the past, might be good to understand what the ecosystems do, what, what happened, right? And it was the, one of the biggest mass extinctions on the seafloor, so this poor critter um, just died. Anyways, so we know that it was a brief episode. Um, um, the global warming was between 5 and 8 degrees. Deep water temperatures rose, that's very unusual, usually the ocean temperature is quite constant. Um, yeah, something happens to the isotopes. CaCO3 in the deep sea was dissolved, remember? It went from white to brown. Um, it was one of the largest extinctions in the deep marine um, for a miniature. But interestingly, um, the, the life at the surface of the ocean just diversified and terrestrial fauna and flora migrated. So it was not an extinction event at the surface. And that's also why I'm personally interested in because if it's an analog to today, maybe that gives us hope. Maybe it says, well, maybe ecosystems can just adapt, right? Which would be great. So, the big open questions for this event, and that's why we want to model it, and that's how I will get back to which models to use, um, is A, how much power was actually released? And that's the key question, because we know how much warmer it became. If we know how much warmer it became, we know how much power was released, we have a much better grip on climate sensitivity, which is still a really big open question today in climate science and really important for um, future projections. The next open question is where did this carbon actually come from? Because there were no humans around who were driving in cars and flying their planes to Melbourne just uh, in a lecture, which is horrible. Um, <laughs> so where did it come from? There was a reservoir at that time that just out of the blue released lots of carbon into the atmosphere. So it would be nice to know what that was if that reservoir exists today, and if it feels like releasing any carbon in the next future, because that, that would be interesting for us, because we are really battling the climate system right now. If these carbon reservoirs exist, then they might just blow up. Better to know about those. And the last question is, how fast was this carbon actually released? Because then this gives us a little bit of an idea how resilient our ecosystems actually are. Granted, different ecosystems at the time was much warmer climate, but still, we, we actually don't have a good grip on how well life is doing and adapting to past change, because we, we don't have anything in the, in the recent um, geological records that can tell us that. Okay, and before I get back to the models, sorry, I will do a little bit more science, because I think you guys need to learn a little bit of biogeochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I think uh, it's really important so that you understand why it's important to find your chemistry in your climate models. So, um, let's just imagine we would put lots of carbon into the atmosphere very fast here, the left, left side okay, of, of this um, amazing figure, which took me 10 times to uh, get right. But anyway, so we, we put lots of carbon very quickly into the atmosphere. That's what we do today. And that's one of the scenarios that had been put forward to the, for, for the Paleocene you see so maximum in case, if it was, for example, methane hydrates that just blew up, that would be a really quick adding of CO2 to the atmosphere, okay? So what happens if we put lots of CO2 in the atmosphere? Temperatures will go up. Um, this carbon will be absorbed in, in the surface ocean. So we will actually increase, or we will form carbonic acid. That will increase our hydrogen ions, right? I hope that's clear for everyone. That will decrease our pH. So surface pH is 
very, very strongly coupled to CO2 in the atmosphere. That's the thing we know. But if we do it really fast, then this increase in hydrogen ions will also transform some of our carbonate ions into bicarbonate ions. So a CO3 2 minus into an HCO3 minus. So we actually deplete our carbonate ions. And that's the problem for all these white critters in the ocean that like to build their shells out of CaCO3. They swim through the water and try to find calcium and carbonate ions, put them together, build their shells. That's what they do, right? So they if you take away the carbonate, they have a problem. And that's what we call today acidification. It's actually, we are way more worried about the lower carbonate levels in our surface waters right now than about the pH, because that's really what will affect biology. Okay? So, and that's why we would get in this case strong initial acidification. So, on the other hand, if, for example, um, CO2 increases very slowly, let's say by some slow background voltage, right? In that case, CO2 will still go up in the atmosphere, pH will still go down, but now other long-term feedbacks will kick in and restore this carbonate ion concentration. For example, we'll start to dissolve marine sediments. That will give us more carbonate ion. We will increase the weathering rates on land because we will have acid rain, we will have warmer temperatures that will actually solve a little bit more of the calcium carbonate on land, will give us more carbonate ion in the ocean. So if it happens slowly, the carbonate doesn't plunge as much, and we only get a week to moderate acidification in the surface ocean. In most cases, the carbon will end up in the deep ocean, and we get long-term acidification, uh, an extinction event, which we see at the PDM. So at the PDM, we actually see this scenario. The surface didn't change much. It changed, but didn't change much, whereas the deep ocean changed. So by trying to modeling that event, we really need a model that has some biogeochemistry in it, because otherwise we won't get these feedbacks. Okay? Okay, so let's just see what, what would be the perfect model to model that event, because we're interested in it, because it is very sadly the closest to what we have today. Um, first of all, we don't need any ice. There was no ice. I hope I convinced you we need a good ocean ecology and biogeochemistry model. We also need a good ocean circulation model because there was some um, evidence for decreased oxygen levels, for example, in the ocean. I will get to that in a minute. We certainly need marine sediments. I would like to have some vegetation as part of the biogeochemical cycle. I honestly don't care what atmospheric circulation. <laughs> but I do like, I would love to have some chemistry, actually. Because if it was methane high rates and we got lots of methane into the atmosphere, then lots of other uh, reaction would have happened in the atmosphere. And it's better if we have that in the model. So the perfect model for that would be a model like this. Um, and I would love to have some isotopes in it too. And again, I can tell you this model unfortunately doesn't exist. So you always have to take, um, make, make compromises, right? When you try to understand anything from the climate system, this model. So let's see which models actually have been used to look at this event. And I put them here on the x-axis in dynamic complexity and on the y-axis in biogeochemical complexity. So the very first um, simulations of this event were done with an uncoupled ocean GCM. Um, they're interesting because they were the first ones, but honestly, there's only that much you can do with just ocean physics to get such a event right. Um, then there's a law. Lots of studies that actually just use box models, so basically you have several boxes that represent parts of the ocean and atmosphere. They are useful because you can do millions of simulations and then um, look at the, the range of possible permeable space and narrow that down. But of course they don't have any dynamics, so they're only a little bit useful. Um, just as an example, as I said, there's many, but this is a paper that um, appeared last year, and uh, what they did, they took this box model and they read like a million different simulations and then they uh, pinpointed the ones that are the degree with the sediment data we have of this event and came up with the most likely um, CO2 release here in black for the PTM compared to today in red. So you can see it's actually not an analog. It was much less of a CO2 release over a much longer time. And the interesting part here, if you look at the acidification, that's the last one, is that today we really plunge deep, um, whereas during that event actually we didn't because it was much slower than that. So these box models can tell us something and can, can put today versus this event into um, comparison, but um, they can't do any dynamics. Um, CGINI has been used for this. This is also an Earth system model. Um, it's a little bit uh, more complex. It has a dynamic ocean, uh, a 
non-dynamic atmosphere, sediments, biogeochemistry, several isotopes actually end weathering. And this one is already a little bit more interesting because you can do some 3D dynamics and you can actually now start to, well that looks a little bit like Legoland still, <laughs> so that's Australia here. And also topography was a little different a long time ago. But you can now really start to compare model simulations at the points where we actually have the data. So it's still a bit more complex model. Um, the UIC model is even more complex. That's the one that I used for this event. And I actually will tell you it was too complex because it was just too long to get um, into equilibrium. So that one has a dynamic ocean, um, quite complex ocean biogeochemistry, sediments, weathering, dynamic vegetation, but only a simple atmosphere. But for this event, I actually, because you have to, um, you have to integrate the model for 30, 40,000 years. Um, so that was a year and a half of computation time on NCI. So it's a little bit too complex for an event like this. But the nice thing with this is um, once you get these simulations, you really can see how the ocean circulation likely changed and compare this to, to, to the data we have. So we could actually do something more complex. And on the very right bottom corner here, that's so the most dynamically complex model, but not biogeochemically complex model that has been used um, is CCC, CCSM3. Um, so this one has a full atmosphere GCM, ocean GCM, a little bit of biogeochemistry and the left land module. Okay. So I uh, didn't use that, um, but I believe, so this is actually a good model because now we can also see, for example, how precipitation changed during one event. I don't think we can believe these results, but at least we can look at them. Um, but I think it's too complex. Um, and I will tell you in a second why I think it's too complex. Um, is it coming now? Yes. So there was some, during that event, there was some evidence that parts of, of the ocean became anoxic, so it didn't have any oxygen anymore. And that's a problem for life, that's also a problem for biogeochemistry. Um, I will go through this, but that's also feeds back on the common side on, on, on climate. So that's something we really need to understand. Was the ocean anoxic? If so, where? If so, was it widespread? How bad was it? Um, so the people who, who, who did the simulations with CCSM3, they found a completely anoxic bottom ocean. All oxygen was gone. This is this last um, simulation here that's 16 times today's CO2. And anything that's green or blue means there's no oxygen for life anymore. Dead ocean. Okay. Um, and I was really shocked when I saw that. Because with my model, um, this here is my simulation, I only put things in color here that actually can kill biology. So wherever you see orange, okay, I have regions where biology is not happy, but I certainly don't find it everywhere in the ocean. I only find it in the tropics and in the Arctic here, a little bit in the Southern Ocean. And if you look into the water profile, so this is um, depth here, that's latitude, you can see it's mostly in the first thousand meters. It's only really in the Ar Arctic where it goes all the way down. And if you look at the bottom layer, a little bit in the Atlantic, but my whole Pacific, um, there's life, there's oxygen. So you compare this to the CCSM3, that basically the whole world is would be brown in my world. So I was, I was um, puzzled by this. And then I realized that actually their model is too complex for an event like this here, because they can't integrate it for long enough. They only integrate it for, I don't remember, 2,500 years maybe? Yeah, 2,500 years. So what happens if you take a complex model like this and you start with present day conditions, okay, and you increase your two, you increase the surface temperature quite dramatically, that increases the surface temperature of the ocean that stratifies your ocean completely. So you don't have much ventilation happening. So the water must just sit there forever. You still have biological production. This stuff breaks down, gets remineralized, the bacteria that are mineralizing the use of the oxygen so that you keep ocean as an oxygen. Yes, true. But after 2,500 years, the model is still trying to get into equilibrium. Right? You start from a really cold state and you just put a heat source in the, in, in the atmosphere, it still ramps up. And it actually takes 10,000, 15,000 years until your ocean is physically in equilibrium again. And once your ocean is physically in equilibrium in the deep ocean, it's time to actually warm up you do have ventilation, and there is no oxygen anoxia everywhere, okay? So I think what they did in, in, 
in this paper you said they model what's in the equilibrium. So it's useless because during the PETN we never started from a cold state like today and just ramped it up. They started from a warm state already, right? So um, I think all I wanted to point out here is that complexity of model. The more complex a model, the better, of course, because you have more processes. And, but in some cases, you need to make sure that these models are not too complex. Can you still run them long enough to actually get a result that makes sense? Or is it still in a transient state? Okay? Good. So a little bit more on this oxygen, because I think it's um, fascinating, the whole oxygen story in, in the ocean, because it really shows how bad our climate models are to be. So in, in, in these really warm stages, we know that there were these large regions apparently where we didn't have any oxygen. So to get this, you can either have an increased resident times of, of your water masses with very sluggish simulation, just explain this, because your biological production continues, remineralization continues, so the oxygen will just be used up. Um, we don't get that with our models. There is, to my knowledge, no simulation that is in equilibrium that doesn't have some ventilation. It's just not a stable state of the model. It's a transient state, it's not a stable state. So is it real or not? Was the ocean ever really so sluggish or not? We don't know. So maybe our models are right, maybe our models are wrong, in which case maybe our models are too diffusive and we need higher resolution. I, I don't have the answer. Um, another way to get to this hypoxia in, in deep waters is just to have a warmer deep ocean. Because um, the warmer the water, the less oxygen it can hold. It's basically like your, your Coke bottle, you open two Coke bottles in the summer, you drink a little bit, and then you want to go play tennis, you leave one in the sun, you put one in the fridge. Um, you want to drink the one that's in the fridge because the one in the sand doesn't have any CO2 anymore. <laughs> it's all gone. Same for oxygen, right? The colder the water is at the surface, the more oxygen they will actually take up and take this oxygen with them. If you have warm water, you start with less oxygen. So, and that's a huge problem because during these warm events, we know that the high latitudes where we do form deep water were actually much warmer than our models are able to predict. And I will get to that. That's a big problem with our models today. They don't get the polar amplification right. Okay, so another thing that our models don't do very well. The other way to get deep sea hypoxia is to increase the remineralization, okay, to have more um, decomposition. And you can do this in different ways. You can either have more productivity at the surface. If you make more organic matter, then you will have more that rains down and more that gets um, remineralized. You can increase the export. If you make bigger particles at the surface that sink faster, they might make it deeper before they get remineralized. Um, or you can increase the respiration. If you have warmer waters, then your bacteria will get into over dry. Just remineralize much faster. And I think that's a big problem too, because our ecosystem models that we have nowadays in our models are in, in their absolute infancy. They're so simplified, right? So I, I think the most complex ones have two, three different classes of phytoplankton, maybe two classes of zooplankton, and that's it. Two or three nutrients. Okay, there's no trophic levels. There's no variety in between, between different bacteria or, 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 or phytoplankton in the ocean. So, and even with those very simplified models, they are over-tuned. So we basically tune them so we get the biogeochemical profiles we see in the ocean today. And we tune them in a way, of course, it's based on the physics of the ocean model. So if your ocean model has biases in the physics, then per definition, these biases go into your tuning of a biogeochemical model. So you have errors within errors that then propagate, okay? And there's absolutely no guarantee that these really simple population dynamic models that we have in our models are A, realistic, or B, applied to the current climate, a climate that we might reach in 50 years. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm very careful with those models right now. You will get out of here and say I don't believe any models. <laughs> and the last one is um, the whole sediment interaction that none of the models has in them. So if you have Oxygen depleted waters that touch sediments. There are some reactions that happen, and the sediments will actually release iron, which is a nutrient that is actually missing in the ocean. So if we get more iron in the ocean, we will increase productivity. We will increase this whole hypoxia problem, and they release phosphorus, which is one of the nutrients. Okay, so that's also positive feedback that absolutely none of the models has in them. 
Okay, so um, Andreas Oschlis, who's also a really close colleague, um, just wrote a, a review in Nature Geoscience about how well the models today do actually and, and model these changes in oxygen over, over the past 20 years. And um, you can read all this yourself, but uh, one of the take home messages is that even today, in the really high resolution models we have, the models simulate only about half of the ox oceanic oxygen loss in the from observations. So it's not only these, these old episodes where we have very limited data and we don't know much that we don't get right with our models, it's even nowadays we really don't get this biogeochemical physical interaction right. And I think that's why we need to put way more efforts to get our ESMs up to speed. Okay. And he says that um, A, we, we need to, of course, improve our process parameterization and we need increased resolution, but we also need a better understanding of biogeochemical processes. And I think that's absolutely key. Um, our biogeochemical ecological models in the ocean are way too simple, overtuned, and we actually don't understand what's going on. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that there's still lots of work to do in your careers when you move on in making our ocean ecology, biogeochemistry, reactions with the physics of ocean simulations much better. Okay? Because I think it's really important if we want to have good projections of future climate change. Um, there's something else I quickly want to touch upon, and that's, um, and we stay in this warm climate for now, just after the Paleo Eocene, so maximum the early Eocene here, that's this part, is also very warm. And people have tried to follow that. And this is from a paper from a little bit old, 2012, where they did a model um, intercomparison study of different couple of GCNs that were actually forced under boundary conditions that corresponded to the early Eocene year. And you can see, let's just pick one here, um, let's say, what, the one in the middle here, Echo and Five, German model, I can trust you, I'm German. Uh, <laughs> so that's latitude on the x axis and temperature on the y axis. You see that, of course, the poles are cold and the tropics are warm, and then you increase CO2 and you increase the whole temperature and the poles get a little bit warmer, but they still, you still see this big difference between the temperatures in the tropics and the temperatures in the poles. These little points are the proxy data. That's how warm it actually was. So a good model should actually have a profile that looks like this, almost straight. Okay, none of these models get that right. And that's of a um, big concern because this is a kind of climate we actually head into. Like if we go RCP 8.5 by the end of this century, we have like 950 ppm. The early UC was about 900,000 ppm. That's where we're heading to. So if we want to trust our models, we better understand why they don't get this polar amplification right. Okay. And I just quickly, um, that's an, an old problem. We know about it since forever. This is here, Matt Huber wrote in 2001. What mechanism maintains warm poles without warming the tropics? Um, that's another from 2014. Our models are either not sensitive enough or additional forcing remains missing. Something is missing in our models to get that right. And I quickly walk you through um, just through one thought process. Um, so that's here, the early, that's actually like Paleocene, but it doesn't matter. Um, what you see here is modeled SST. And the points are proxy data we have. This way more, but these are the more robust ones, the ones that we actually trust. But you can see the model is doing okay here, it's doing okay here, kind of okay here. It's a little bit too warm in the tropics, but it's totally up in, in the Arctic, like totally up in the Arctic. So now we can think what happened here. So first of all, the Arctic was almost an enclosed basin. There's not much um, exchange other than here to the, what they call the St. Kilda Basin at that time. So this warm temperatures is unlikely that it came through ocean transport from lower and lower latitudes, but it was almost in those spaces. At the same time, because it was almost enclosed, um, actually in that in these latitudes you have more precipitation than evaporation on top of these rivers that go into the Arctic. The Arctic was actually really, really um, stable, uh, stratified. So the surface there was really, really fresh. And there's some proxy evidence for that too. And then the model is very fresh too. So therefore, we don't have much exchange with the lower latitudes, we don't have much exchange with deeper layers, therefore we can conclude that our SST proxy here probably reflects surface temperatures, right? Atmospheric temperatures. So therefore, the atmospheric temperatures were warm. 
how can we get the atmospheric temperatures to warm? Um, I think the most likely reason was that um, long wave radiation in these uh, latitudes changed. And probably they changed because there were different clouds around. Um, and that has been actually seen as one of the grand challenges. Um, and several groups work on that to try to see if our models actually represent these clouds, right? And I think that's the most likely explanation that we do not get these polar clouds right in warmer um, planets. There were other hypotheses. One said maybe short wave radiation was different. Maybe we just had very different oblique with during these events. That has been dismissed pretty much. So don't even look at it. I don't know why I kept it on the slide. <laughs> Another one is, of course, maybe there was some crazy heat transport in the atmosphere. Maybe we had much stronger winds, so increase in latent heat transport. Maybe. Unlike. I don't know. Um, I, one, one of um, our PhD students, actually she's not here today, she, she's in the UK, but she's working on that. She's really looking at clouds. Okay, so maybe I convinced you now that we still have work to do in the ocean ecology, ecology and biology, and the biogeochemistry part, but also in the atmospheric part especially. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm going to talk really fast. Um, <laughs> okay, so another thing that I think our ESMs don't do very well um, is climate sensitivity. Um, here you have CO2 on the x axis, a temperature anomaly on the y axis, and this red point here is the early Eocene, the one we just talked about, and lengths where the models don't get the warming at the high latitudes, right? Um, so this is a point that's quite high up. The uncertainties, of course, are huge happened a long time ago. If you put, and I just want to show these ones, so just ignore all the other points, you just look at the blue ones. The blue ones are model coupled, model GCM simulations under these boundary conditions. And, um, and you can see that their slope is not quite as steep as the one of the process. Okay, so on top of not getting the full amplification right, we also don't seem to get the climate sensitivity right. And that's also a problem for the future. Um, that's a, a paper here from um, Tobias Friedrich, who put all the paleo proxy data of the last 700,000 years. The same thing that's in this case, it's radio forcing anomaly on the x axis and global mean SAT on the y axis, and the slope basically gives you the climate sensitivity. So, all this here is data, all these different dots, and then he just extrapolated the data um, for the future, and that gives us a much Steeper slope than what our models actually predict. Okay, so it was a different uh, way to look at this um, problem, but shows again that our models seem to underestimate climate sensitivity. So I've heard rumors that the new simulations that are simulated right now, because you say this, have a much higher um, climate sensitivity, or I high hopes that maybe we got a little bit closer to what actually the Earth is telling us how it should be. Okay. Um, so to get the climate sensitivity right, we of course have to get all of these components right. And <laughs> yeah, good luck. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> okay, so my last five minutes, very quickly, um, I wanted to take you to much closer time periods and much faster time scales and variability. And I'm going to quickly talk about millennial variability during the last glacial. You can see that there's lots of lines that go up and down. Uh, lots of variability. Um, very different time from today here. That's how today looks if you look out down to the Arctic. That's how it used to look like 21,000 years ago. That's the last glacial maximum. We had you know, huge ice sheets here over America. Um, Montreal is somewhere here. I think Chicago is here. Um, that's a Laurentide ice sheet and also some ice sheets over Eurasia. Um, that's not very long ago. So humans were around. They had um, fascinating activities like hunting the mammoths. And um, they left us some nice hens in caves, and even a beautiful penguin here um, in a cave in, in southern France. Unfortunately, it didn't leave us any good records of temperatures of atmosphere ocean or precipitation. And so we have to reconstruct those, um, mostly through ice cores. Okay, so what we know during that time, um, every now and then, every few thousand years, something happened that was quite impressive. It's called a Heimlich event. And during these high events, for some reason, this big Laurentide ice sheet decided to discharge lots of icebergs. And not only the Laurentide ice sheets, also the other ice sheets around the North Atlantic. And all these ice sheets just started to flood, and the North Atlantic must have been a fantastic. 
plastic side. And these events are, are, are named after Vater Heinrich, who first identified those in sediment course. So he took a boat uh, in the middle of the Atlantic and, and drove the core into the sediments and uh, found the normal gunk mud that you would expect. And every now and then he found a layer with much coarser debris and little pebbles and things that really don't belong in the middle of the Atlantic. And the only reason they were there, of course, um, icebergs here that actually split off ice shelves had the stuff frozen into the bottom of, of the iceberg. <laughs> and that was frozen in when, when the ice sheet was touching the rock. Okay, so we have all this dirt that's actually frozen to the ice and then gets dropped. Okay, so we know these kind of events existed and you can see them here. And, and this is the time series going from 65,000 years to 25,000 years. And these colored bars, each of them is a Heinrich event. The first line is basically a representation of, of temperature of a Greenland. You can see it was really cold during Heinrich events. It drops every time. And if you look at CO2 at the second one, you see that CO2 increased every single time for the bigger ones. Okay. So for the longest time in the, in the community, what we thought is, oh, well, we put some ice in the North Atlantic, and then magically CO2 becomes out of the ocean. And that is something we need to understand, because again, the ocean has a huge storage of CO2. So if we change the circulation today, which we do with global warming, we want to see if any of the CO2 might actually come out and add to our emissions. Okay? So we want to understand that. There have been heated discussions, like heated discussions during, during conferences where I got people standing up yelling at each other, because some models showed that and others didn't. So Louis, Louis Manuel works with me at CCIC and I, we have two different models, both of our models did not show that. Both of our models, we could put ice in here, and depending on what we did otherwise, we could either get CO2 out of the ocean, or sometimes even we drew CO2 down. And other people just kept on, I mean, they get very personal and said, your model is crap. <laughs> uh, so that went out for years. And then finally, Yulia Gotcha, thank her, um, I'd still impress, <laughs> took all the studies she could find where people had a model where they put water into the fossil bank. So everybody has a model. It's the first thing they do. They take a whole separate model and put it in the fossil bank and see what's happening to the climate system, right? So she took all these studies that did this and had some representation of the carbon cycle and put them on a plot where you see the magnitude of freshwater forcing here and the change in delta CO2. And surprise, there's absolutely no trend. So some models show this increase, others don't. Then we said, okay, maybe it's on the magnitude, maybe it's the total freshwater. No. So every little symbol is a different study. They are all over the place. And of course they are all over the place. Because Julia then did this amazing figure that I still don't understand. I'm still staring at it. It's way too complicated. Uh, maybe by the time it appears, I will have understood it. But if you put fresh water into the North Atlantic here, yes, you kill your Atlantic overturning circulation. Yes, this will do something to your, to your carbon cycle in the Atlantic. But at the same time, you shift your ITCZ you change the dust supply, or you change precipitation, or you change the dust supply, you change the whole bicarbon production here, um, net primary production in the ocean. You also shift your southern hemispheric westerlies, which then changes your water masses in the southern ocean. The southern ocean is basically the big opening door to the carbon cycle in the ocean, right? So you change Antarctic bottom water formation because you change northern and deep water formation. You change Antarctic intermediate water formation because you change the winds. You change productivity because you change your dust. There's tons of things that happen here. And you change, of course, the carbon on land because your boreal soil carbon will change. So just by putting a little bit of water in the North Atlantic, you have a whole cascade of feedbacks. And depending on which model you take and how how good each of these components are represented, you will get a different answer because there are so many different players in, in this question. So what she did then is she put all these studies that have been used to do the study into a big table and described the different modules. So how complex was the ocean model? How complex was the biogeochemistry model? How complex was the CS model? And she color coded them. So the darker co colors here are really um, the complexity of the model. Okay. So for something like a kind of event, what do you really need to get it right? You, of course, need a very complex physics of the ocean, because it's a whole physical oceanography problem, OK? You also want an ecological model, because you're looking at the biogeochemistry. You're looking at the carbon cycle. So you need a dark green. 
you do want a complex CS model because it's fundamentally a, a phenomenon that, that will involve high latitudes. Um, not so sure about the land surface model, but you do need a dynamic vegetation model because the vegetation will change. That will change your carbon. Um, and who cares about atmospheres? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so you want a dark blue, dark green, dark green, dark red. So you look at this, and you see, of course, they found all different answers because each of these models actually um, emphasizes different parts of the planet. So, okay. That's actually all I wanted to say, I think. Okay, so I personally have actually really high hopes into a third system models. They're quite new. Um, I, I hope you realize this. It's only over the last 10 years that we really started to develop all these extra components. We realized that um, by using them that we um, utterly underperform when we take our models out of the comfort zone. So I actually do more or less trust our climate models um, for very really low emission scenarios and our very small time scales. But if we continue on 8.5, I wouldn't trust them one bit um, after 2050. Because I think we get into a completely different climate, our models are not fit to actually represent this well. Um, we can use those models to see which components are still missing and which ones are not very well represented. And this is just my list. That doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean that everybody agrees with it. But I think where we really need to put more research effort in is to get our clouds right. Ocean ecosystem models are still a mess. They're totally too simple and overtuned. Biogeochemical feedbacks, the whole permafrost, even on land, but also in the ocean, are very, very simplified. We still don't have any good interaction with um, sediments, etc. And ice ocean directions are, of course, key if we want to see any nonlinear reactions in the near future. Okay, I think I'll leave you with this.